G'day, I'm Ray. Welcome, or welcome back, to another short and sweet mini-doc about the monsters that walk amongst us. The Bender family, more well known as the Bloody Benders, were a family of serial killers in Labette County, Kansas, the United States, from May of 1871 to December 1872. The family consisted of John Bender, his wife Elvira, their son John Jr., and their daughter Kate. While there is no definitive number, estimates report that the Black Benders killed at least a dozen travelers, or as many as 20 before their crimes were discovered. The family's fate remains unknown, with theories ranging from a lynching of the family to a successful escape. In October 1870, five families of spiritualist homesteaded in and around the township of Osage in northwestern Labette County. One of these families was John Bender and John Bender Jr. Elvira Bender and her daughter Date arrived in the fall of 1871. The Benders divided their cabin into two rooms with a canvas wagon cover. They used the smaller room at the rear for living quarters and the front room as a general store where they sold dry goods. A crudely drawn, misspelt sign, Grocery, G-R-O-C-R-Y, indicated this and their lack of English. The front section also contained the kitchen and dining table where travelers could stop for a meal or spend the night. John Bender Sr. was around 60 years old and spoke little English. The English he did speak was guttural and usually unintelligible. Elvira Bender was 55 years old. She allegedly spoke little English and was so unfriendly that her neighbors called her a she-devil. John Bender Jr. was around 25 years old and handsome with auburn hair and a mustache. He spoke English fluently with a German accent. He was prone to laughing aimlessly which led many to consider him a half-wit. Kate Bender, who was around 23, was cultivated and attractive and spoke English well with little accent. A self-proclaimed healer and psychic, she distributed flyers advertising her supernatural powers and her ability to cure illnesses. She also conducted seances and gave lectures on spiritualism for which she gained notoriety for advocating free love. The Benders were, wild, were widely believed to be German immigrants. No documentation or definitive proof of their relationships to one another or where they were born has ever been found. Elvira was rumored to have murdered several husbands, but none of these rumors were ever proven. These are some comments from those who knew them and have written about the Benders. The old man was a repulsive, hideous brute without a redeeming trait, dirty, profane, and ill-tempered. Old Mrs. Bender was a dirty old Dutch crone. Her face was a fit picture of the midnight hag that wove the spell, murderous ambition about the soul of Macbeth. Young Bender, seen when excited, recalled the grave-robbing hyena at once to mind. Kate proclaimed herself responsible to no one save herself. In May 1871, the body of a man named Jones was discovered in Drum Creek with a cut throat and a crushed skull. The owner of the Drum Creek claim was suspected, but no action was taken. In February 1872, the bodies of two men were found with the same injuries as Jones. By 1873, reports of missing people who had passed through the area had become so common that travelers began to avoid the trail. In the winter of 1872, George Newton Longcor left Independence, Kansas with his infant daughter Mary Ann to resettle in Iowa. They were never seen again. In the spring of 1873, Longcore's former neighbor, 
Dr. William Henry York went looking for them and questioned homesteaders along the trail. York reached Fort Scott on March 9th and began the return, churn, the return journey to Independence but never arrived. When York had two brothers, Ed York living in Fort Scott and Colonel Alexander M. York, a Civil War veteran lawyer and member of the Kansas State Senate from Independence. Both knew of William's travel plans and when he failed to return, began an all-out search for the missing doctor. Colonel York, leading a company of some 50 men, questioned every traveler along the trail and visited all the area homesteads. On March 28, 1873, Colonel York arrived at the Benders Inn with a Mr. Johnson, explaining that his brother had gone missing and asking if they had seen him. They admitted Dr. York had stayed with them and suggested the possibility that he had run into trouble with Indians. Colonel York agreed that this was possible and remained for dinner. On April 3rd, Colonel York returned to the inn with armed men after learning that a woman had fled the inn after Elvira Bender had threatened her with knives. Elvira allegedly could not understand English while the younger Benders denied the claim. When York repeated the claim, Elvira became enraged, saying the woman was a witch who had cursed her coffee and ordered the men to leave her house. Before York left, Kate asked him to return alone the following Friday night and she would use her clairvoyant abilities to help him find his brother. The men with York were convinced that the Benders and a neighboring family, the Roaches, were guilty and wanted to hang them all, but York insisted that evidence must be found. Around the same time, neighboring communities began to make accusations that the Osage community was responsible for the disappearances and the Osage Township arranged a meeting in the Harmony Grove schoolhouse. Seventy-five locals attended the meeting, including Colonel York and both John Bender and John Bender Jr. After discussing the disappearances, including that of William York, they agreed to obtain a warrant to search every homestead between Big Hill Creek and Drum Creek. Despite York's strong suspicions regarding the Biden since his visit several weeks earlier, no one had watched them and it was not noticed for several days that they had fled. Three days after the township meeting, Billy Toll was driving cattle past the Bender property when he noticed that the inn was abandoned and the farm animals were unfed. The township trustee called for volunteers and several hundred turned out to form a search party that included Colonel York. When the party arrived at the inn, they found the cabin empty of food, clothing, and personal possessions. A bad odor was noticed and traced to a trapdoor underneath a bed, nailed shut. After opening the trap, the party found clotted blood on the floor of the empty room beneath. They broke up the stone slab with sledgehammers but found no bodies and determined that the smell was from blood that had soaked into the soil. The men then physically lifted the cabin and moved it to the side to dig under it, but no bodies were found. They then probed the ground around the cabin with a metal rod, especially in the disturbed soil of the vegetable garden and orchard, where Dr. York's body was found later that evening, buried face down with his feet barely below the surface. The probing continued until midnight with another nine suspected grave sites marked before the men were satisfied they had found them all and retired for the night. The next morning another eight bodies were found in seven of the nine suspected graves while one was found in the well along with several body parts. All but one had their heads bashed with a hammer and throats cut and newspapers reported that all were indecently mutilated. The body of a young girl was found with no injury sufficient to cause death. It was speculated that she had been strangled or buried alive. 
It is conjectured that when a guest stayed at the Bender's Bed and Breakfast Inn, the hosts would give the guests a seat of honour at the table that was positioned over a trapdoor into the cellar. With the victim's back to the curtain, Kate would distract the guest while John Bender, or his son, came from behind the curtain and struck the guest on the right side of the skull with a hammer. One of the women would cut the victim's throat to ensure her death, and the body was then dropped through the trapdoor. Once in the cellar, the body would be stripped and later buried somewhere on the property. Although some of the victims were wealthy, others carried little of value, and it was surmised that the Benders had, said, had killed them simply for the sheer thrill. Testimony from people who had stayed at the Benders Inn and managed to escape before they could be killed appeared to support the presumed execution method of the Benders. William Pickering said that when he had refused to sit near the wagon cloth because of the stains on it, Kate Bender had threatened him with a knife, whereupon he fled the premises. A Catholic priest, Father Paul Ponziglione, claimed to have seen one of the Bender men concealing a large hammer, at which point he became uncomfortable and quickly departed. The Bender family sold stolen goods such as horses, saddles, clothes and other possessions under the guise that people who spent the night and were unable to pay would pay with goods. At another time, a Mrs. Fitz, while sitting at a dinner, became uneasy and sensed a muffled movement behind the canvas. Kate issued a command, but before anything could happen, the terrified Fitz fled. Two men who had traveled to the inn to experience Kate Bender's psychic powers stayed for dinner, but refused to sit at the table next to the cloth, instead preferring to eat their meal at the main shop counter. Kate then became abusive toward them, and shortly afterward the Bender men emerged from behind the cloth. At this point the customers felt uneasy and decided to leave, a move that almost certainly saved their lives. Detectives following wagon tracks discovered the Bender's wagon abandoned with a starving team of horses, with one of the mares lame just outside the city limits of Thayer. It was confirmed that the family had bought tickets on the Leavenworth, Lawrence and Galveston Railroad for Humboldt. At Chinut, John Jr. and Kate left the train and caught the MK and T train south to the terminus in Red River County near Denison, Texas. From there, they traveled to an outlaw colony thought to be in the border region between Texas and New Mexico. They were not pursued, as lawmen following outlaws into this region often never returned. One detective later claimed that he had traced the pair to the border, where he had found that John Jr. had died of apoplexy. The elder benders did not leave the train at Humboldt, but instead continued north to Kansas City, where it is believed they purchased tickets for St. Louis, Missouri. Several groups of vigilantes were formed to search for the benders. Many stories say that one vigilante group caught the benders and shot all of them but Kate, whom they burned alive. Another group claimed they had caught the benders and lynched them before throwing their bodies into the Verdigris River. Yet another claimed to have killed the benders during a gunfight and buried their bodies on the prairie. No one ever claimed the $3,000 reward. The story of the Bender's escape spread, and the search continued on and off for the next 50 years. Often two women traveling together were accused of being Kate Bender and her mother. In 1884, it was reported that a John Flickinger had committed suicide in Lake Michigan. Also in 1984, an elderly man matching John Bender Sr.'s description was arrested in Montana for a murder committed near Salmon, Idaho, where the victim had been killed by a hammer blow to the head. A message requesting positive identification was sent to Cherry Vale, but the suspect severed his foot to escape his leg irons and bled to death. By the time a deputy from Cherry Vale arrived, identification was impossible due to decomposition. Several weeks after the discovery of the bodies, 
Addison Roach and his son-in-law, William Buxton, were arrested as accessories. In total, 12 men of bad repute would be arrested, including Brockman. All had been involved in disposing of the victim's stolen goods with Mitt Cherry, a member of the Vigilance Committee, implicated for forging a letter from one of the victims, informing the man's wife they had arrived safely at his destination in Illinois. Brockman would be arrested again 23 years later for the rape and murder of his own 18-year-old daughter. On October 31, 1889, it was reported that Mrs. Almira Monroe, also known as Mrs. Almira Griffith, and Mrs. Sarah Eliza Davis had been arrested in Niles, Michigan several weeks earlier for larceny. They were released after being found not guilty, but were then immediately rearrested for the Benders murders. According to the Pittsburgh Dispatch, the daughter of one of the Benders victims, Mrs. Frances E. McCann, had reported the pair to authorities in early October after tracking them down. Mrs. McCann's story came from dreams about her father's murder, which she discussed with Sarah Eliza. The women's identities were later confirmed by two Osage Township witnesses from a tintype photograph. In mid-October, Deputy Sheriff Leroy Dick, the Osage Township trustee who had headed the search of the Bender property, arrived in Michigan and arrested the couple on October 30th following their release on the larceny charges. Mrs. Monroe resisted, declaring that she would not be taken alive, but was subdued by local deputies. Mrs. Davis claimed that Mrs. Monroe was Elvira Bender, but that she was not Kate, but her sister Sarah. She later signed an affidavit to that effect, while Monroe continued to deny the identification and in turn accused Sarah Eliza of being the real Kate Bender. Deputy Sheriff Dick, along with Mrs. McCann, escorted the pair to Oswego, Kansas, where seven members of a 13-member grand panel confirmed the identification and committed them for trial. Another of Mrs. Monroe's daughters, Mary Gardai, later provided an affidavit claiming that her mother, under the name of Almira Marks, was serving two years in the department uh, in the Detroit House of Corrections in 1872 for the manslaughter of her daughter-in-law, in Emily Mark. Records of the incarceration back up this affidavit. At her hearing, Mrs. Monroe denied any knowledge of Shearer or the manslaughter charge and remained incarcerated with her daughter. Originally scheduled for February 1980, the trial was held over to May. Mrs. Monroe now admitted she had married a Mr. Shearer in 1872 and claimed she had previously died, denied it as she did not want the court to know that her name was Shearer at that time and that she had a conviction for manslaughter. Their attorney, also producing a marriage certificate indicating that Mrs. Davis had been married in Michigan in 1872, the time when several of the murders were committed. Eyewitness testimony was given that Mrs. Monroe was Elvira Bender. Judge Calvin dismissed Mar Mary Garday's affidavit. He found that other affidavits supporting Garday's were sufficient proof that the women could never be convicted and he discharged them both. The affidavits and other papers are missing from the file in the Bet County, so further examination is impossible. Several researchers question the ready acceptance of the affidavit's authenticity and suggest that the county was unwilling to accept the expense of boarding the two women for an extended period. While the two women were certainly criminals and liars, as their defense attorney admitted, the charges were weak and many people doubted their identification as the benders. Additionally, the older woman reportedly spoke with no accent, whereas Ma Bender struggled to speak in English fluently. <laughs>
Who were the victims? One, May 1871. Mr. Jones. A body was found in Drum Creek with a crushed skull and a throat cut. Two and three. February 1872. Two unidentified men were found on the prairie in February 1872 with crushed skulls and throats cut. 4. December 1872. Ben Brown from Howard County, Kansas. $2,600 missing, buried in the apple orchard. 5. December 1872. W. F. McCrotty, Company D, 123rd Illinois Infantry, $38 and a wagon with a team of horses missing. 6. December 1872, Henry McKenzie, relocating to Independence from Hamilton County, Indiana, $36 and a matched team of horses missing. 7. December 1872, Johnny Boyle from Howard County, Kansas, $10, a pacing horse, and an $850 saddle missing, found in Bend as well. 8 and 9, December 1872, George Newton Longcore and his 18-month-old daughter, Mary Ann. In preparation for his return to Iowa, George had purchased a team of horses from his neighbor, Dr. William Henry York, who later went looking for George and was also murdered. Both were Civil War veterans, $1,900 missing. The daughter was thought to have been buried alive, but this was unproven. No injuries were found on her body and she was fully clothed, including mittens and a hood. Both were buried together in the apple orchard. 10. December 1872. John Greary, buried in the apple orchard. 11. December 1872. Red Smith, buried in the apple orchard. December 1872. Abigail Roberts, buried in the apple orchard. 13 through 15. December 1872, various body parts. The parts do not belong to any of the other victims found and are believed to belong to at least three additional victims. 16, 17, 18 and 19, December 1872. During the search, the bodies of four unidentified males were found in Drum Creek and the surrounds. All four had crushed skulls and throats cut. One may have been Jack Bogart, whose horse was purchased from a friend of the Benders after he went missing in 1872. 20. May 1873. Dr. William York, $2,000 missing, buried in the apple orchard. By including the recovered body parts, not match of the bodies found, the finds are speculated to represent the remains of more than 20 victims. Except for Mackenzie and York, who were buried in, in Independence, the Longcores, who were buried in Montgomery County, and McCrotty, who was buried in Parsons, Kansas, none of the other bodies were claimed, and they were reburied at the base of a small hill, one mile southeast of the Bender's Orchard. The search of the cabin resulted in the recovery of three hammers, a shoe hammer, a claw hammer, and a sledgehammer that appeared to match the ident indentations in some of the skulls. A knife with a four inch tapered blade was reportedly found hidden in a mantel clock in the Bender house by Colonel York. Thanks for watching. Join me next time as I delve into another chapter of all about serial killers and mass murderers. Until then, stay safe, share this video, and keep the monsters at bay.